Well, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who is here in Zoom and live on Facebook and to all the organizers. So um, we're going to, before we begin our presentation, I want to preface that we will be um, reading and also storytelling <laughs> as part of it. So both on and off script a little bit today. But before we begin, Ben and I wish to first acknowledge that we are meeting today on the various in various parts of the world. And we want to acknowledge the traditional and ancestral, ancestral stewards of the land we live, work, and currently are self-isolating on. Ben is located in Indianapolis on the traditional Iroquois and Miami territories. And while I live and work in British Columbia on the unceded Silex territory uh, during the pandemic, I'm currently in Alberta on Treaty 6 territory. Now, in our presentation today, we are going to be focusing on our senses and we want to stress that accessibility in our presentation matters. Um, so we'll be sharing slides and we will visually describe the slides to, to and the photographs and images within them. So if you require any clarification of the visual or audio you hear throughout our presentation, we look forward to discussing it um, towards the end. And just for those who have other accessibility needs, um, I'm Fiona McDonald. Um, I go by the pronouns she, her, and L, and I'm wearing a navy top with brown hair, fair skin, and my background is my uh, childhood home. So without further ado, <laughs> sensory, sensory storytelling, a sound portrait of water. While we find ourselves in the middle of a pandemic with remote learning and working well underway, the urgency for ways to reimagine the way we do research, co-create and experiment is a daily pressure. In this moment, we find ourselves wonderfully situated with our ongoing critical discussion of the creation of digital tools for sensory inclusion and immersive learning environments. We embrace this opportunity today to talk specifically about a type of collaboration that merges an ethnographic approach with digital arts, curation, and sensory knowledges that aims to better understand and engage with environmental issues in person and remotely. Our work emerges from the history of sensor, sensory turn in anthropology and gives an overview of a methodological approach using what is known as a sensory arts-based ethnography for a collaborative design of a digital tool and an environmentally mindful curriculum. The outcomes of this project are to establish an open access 3D sonic learning environment in K-12 classrooms through interdisciplinarity of the social sciences, sciences, arts, and humanity-based modes of inquiry. Our project is called Sensory Storytelling, a sound portrait of water. Um, I'm going to just try to be as graceful as I can to switch here. Um, um, and it captures how innov innovation and pedagogical approaches to informal or non-formal science learning with humanistic inquiry for youth using sensory tactics takes place through collaboration. We take for our collaborative interdisciplinary work the starting point of seeking answers to key pedagogical problems in classrooms that empower youth, engage with multimedia, and create new data about environmental issues. To do this, we find ourselves working at the heart of sensory research that ties anthropology and music technologies of all things together. Um, so our guiding um, question that our main pedagogical question rather is we start with and, and try to address through our presentation today, what role do our senses play in navigating new understandings about the way we engage with collaborative research methods, digital technologies and applied outcomes related to climate justice? So I'm going to say that Ben and I, we work uh, with the premise of thinking with our senses, not about our senses. And this all began with, um, so we're going to shift into storytelling mode here, more ethnographic storytelling. Um, we're going to take you all to uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, where we began our pilot project on our collaboration together. And here you see on your screen a photograph of, of a classroom at the Avalaya Elementary School. And you see the, the whiteboard, the interactive board and notebooks on the floor for uh, 49 youth across several different classes that we worked with a school teacher, uh, Ms. Sarah Gautipin. So the project began by actually going in and working with youth to think about water and water in the high desert is often on everyone's minds. And so obviously working with youth, we have to sort of work within certain safety parameters and in, inside classrooms. And so you see here um, 
models of water. And we see here the different forms of water in ice, uh, in, in solid liquids and in gas. And part of this uh, first stage of the ethnography was to start to look at how, um, how youth um, are, are able to engage with their senses when thinking about water in, its, in their everyday lives and in its various forms. So we ended up starting by engaging with the materiality of the water and taking field notes. So across a, a series of weeks, we worked with the youth um, inside the classroom, getting them to think about their sort of the primary five senses in relation to water, but understanding that there are a broader cultural nuances of sensory appreciation of, of water and its cultural significance. So we collected all of these field notes and we came together as, as groups in the class. So here's, here's a screenshot of us trying to take our field notes and bring it down to what are some of the sensory concepts related to water that this, these youth were identifying. So we focused primarily inside the classroom after having um, used different musical instruments as well, because this was a music class and thinking of how the touch, taste, smell, and sight. So over the course of the, the sort of preliminary part of the ethnography um, in the classroom, we collected over 200 discrete sensory words related to water from the perspective of these youth. So the next step in this was getting them to, to think beyond the, those, the solid liquid and gas water that we're sort of fabricating within the classroom and getting them to go into their everyday lives and continue to think about water. So we made a series of sound kits that students could sign out and bring home and record and continue to take their own field notes. And, and one of the key objectives of this project was the youth were particularly interested in not only learning how to record sound, but also how to sound edit. So there was skills-based engagement in, in tied to their pedagogical um, efforts as well. So at that point, simultaneous to, to me in the field, working with these youth in the classroom in New Mexico, um, is Ben working in Indianapolis. So I'm going to pass this over to Ben now. Thank you. Yeah, this is Benjamin Smith. Um, and uh, I'm the Fiona's collaborator in, in this project here. Um, before our collaboration started, um, I was a, a faculty member in the music technology department at uh, IUPUI in Indiana um, and was had several active research projects um, focusing on visual representations of digital sound and thinking a lot about how we can make uh, digital sound tangible. Um, so the sound and music are just an inherently intangible medium. Um, that's part of the beauty, the ephemerality of it. Um, but to work with it as an artist and a performer, if we're not using acoustic physical uh, production phenomena, instruments, that kind of thing, um, we need ways of capturing it, manipulating it, and uh, seeing it. Um, so my uh, critical player in this was my graduate student, Neil Anderson, um, who you can see on the screen here, uh, while we're in the midst of uh, working with the, uh, you have screens and computers and whiteboards and uh, refreshing drinks amidst all the uh, audio cables. Um, and we were at that time um, doing a bunch of uh, the, the, the public um, outcomes of our work were uh, large multimedia installations that we would do in community centers or uh, gallery spaces. Um, and we were interested in solving the technological problems of setting up in um, these very unique uh, sonic environments. So, you know, each room is a different shape. We don't know what it is necessarily until we get there. We don't know what's going to be in that space. So we're trying to solve this. Um, and we we started, we talked about these setups as haphazard, so haphazard audio arrays or, or speaker arrays. Um, next slide, please. We uh, were at this. So in order to solve this, we were building new technology, writing some new software. Um, on your screen now is a, a wireframe of one of our early prototypes. Um, where we're trying to give us, the, the installers and the creators of these things, um, the tools to uh, configure our setup on the fly and be able to work with the audio, the system that we are working in, be able to 
project sound, to project music into a space um, in a way that gave us fluid control of that. Um, and like all good prototypes, as you can see on the screen, there's a lot of stuff on it. Everything that we thought we could solve is all here. Um, in the, cent the central space is a physical mapping or virtual mapping of the physical space where a dot for where we would think each speaker is going to go. And then on left and right, we have lots of configuration controls um, to manage all of the audio routing and technical things that we would need to do uh, in order to actually run one of these installations. Um, as we were iterating on this, uh, Fiona and I were having conversations and realized that this same technology could very easily become an educational tool. And um, as we were moving through it, we, we were running some uh, public interactive pieces where the audience could touch these this control um, and it was uh, proving we were working towards an intuitive interface and it was proving to be so um, we uh, where am I it's a, uh, let's go next slide so we thought what if we take this this technology that we're building for our own creative work? Can we use this as a, a way to curate um, an installation? And can we just hand it over to especially um, younger uh, people, youth, um, and let them run, let them create their own uh, uh, sound um, ethnography and then present it to the public? And we could just stand back and be the enablers of this. Um, so we started this collaboration with Fiona. She she went out to Santa Fe, started this ethnographic work with these uh, students, and uh, Neil and I started iterating on the, uh, the technology that would enable would enable this. Um, the sound kit process that uh, Fiona's last slide was um, was very successful. They, the students collected hours and hours of sound. Um, all sorts of sounds that they were, uh, wherever they found water in their lives, in their school, in their classrooms, um, thinking about music that reminds them of water. Um, so playing little things on, on instruments as a group or as solo. Um, so we, we came together um, to uh, curate that collection, these hours and hours of sounds. Um, and with a, a side goal of, um, I was very interested in providing um, fourth and fifth graders and high school students the uh, access to audio editing technology so that they would have literacy in digital sound and have this as a, a tool that they could use beyond this uh, process or uh, beyond this, this project. Um, Fiona, next slide, please. So as, as a group of 49 students and and the handful of us uh, guides um, we all came together uh, at this gallery and had a day of of curating and of editing sound uh, we set up stations uh, we taught them how to use the sound editing software and uh, went to work um, we'll just go next slide right away the uh, this, this is uh, an image of one of the open source audio editing programs out there, um, the one that we actually ended up using um, because of the, the free accessibility of it, um, Audacity. Uh, so on the screen here, the, the key part is right in the center. This, the, the red part of it is the current uh, state of the art, essentially, in a visual representation of a sound file. Um, this is a, an area that, that, as a researcher, I'm very interested in um, improvements and advances there. Uh, but so in this visual representation, we have the time goes from left to right. Um, the frequency content goes from low sounds at the bottom to high sounds at the top, matching the, physical, the language of physicality of sound that we use there. Um, and then the brighter colors are the louder frequency components and the darker ones are the less, or uh, the quieter ones. So we put this in front of the fourth and fifth graders. They were incredibly quick on the uptake. They, they figured out how to make this work and how to use it right away. Um, my experience in the past had been primarily with uh, 
college students um, that were often much slower to learn these things and still is reflecting on that to this day. Um, so here's a picture now on your screen of myself working with a small group of our uh, youth, youthful co-collaborators um, while they are deciding which parts of the sound they want to keep and which parts they want to excise. Um, so they're cropping, doing lots of cropping, uh, saving out subfiles. Um, and so right away, they could see on the screen, they could listen to the sound and point to the screen. And they, they would actually reach over and point to it, say, this is the part of the sound that we want. We want this part right here. This is the valuable part. Um, then they would clip it down to that and save it. And the um, part that I had not anticipated, hadn't thought about at all was, then they would name the sound. So as a group, they would agree on what that sound was called. They would save it as a file. Um, so just in that choice of a couple of words, they were exposing um, the value that they saw in that sound and the association that they had with it um, in their life. Um, next one. So through this process there, um, we, can, we, we scrape, they, they end up curating, I don't know, what was it, 150, 160 separate little short sound clips. Um, and we have to figure out how does how do they want to present that as a cohesive whole um, in a you know, in a public opening in this uh, this gallery, uh, and so we decided to categorize the sounds so that we can think about them and manage them into four uh, distinct categories. Um, so on the screen here is our final um, interface that on running on a tablet that is used, um, that they, they use during their actual presentation at the end here. Um, and you can, we can kind of see uh, four circles with the words water, uh, people, music, and words as the four big categories, big buckets that, that all of our sounds would fit into. Um, next slide. Here we have one, one of our, uh, co-curators working on it um, in the in the actual live event, public event. Um, the interface is is retained from the from our original prototype. The white square now is the is the virtual mapping of the physical room, which happened to also be a white square that we were in uh, with a concrete floor. And um, each of the circles was mapped to a stream of sound that was distributed through an array of eight speakers that were kind of just spread around the room. Um, although the, the students also helped us with that, uh, determining which ones should be higher and lower. S some, some sounds would come from speakers that would be more above you. Lower sounds would come from the corners of the room. Um, each of those, so the circle represents a stream of sounds. And by moving, touching the surface and moving those circles around, you bring that stream of sound into the room or you push it to the side. So actually in this, this picture right here, we have um, a, 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 someone has put one sound stream right into the center of the room and pushed the others off to the side. So the, now the room is filled with the singular, say, let's say it's the, the water sounds. So we listen to those, then very fluidly you can pull in and out. Um, and uh, last slide here, we saw, uh, we had two of these tablets and, oh, this is the one that sounds, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> we had uh, two of them. So there, there was very interesting interactions between both this, the students that had created these sounds, but then their parents and just the public attendees um, who would set up, set up between these two and um, either coordinate or play against each other. Um, one would try and create chaos while the other tried to create order. Um, sometimes even verbally coordinated and said, here, now you take all the sounds out of the room. I'll just do the water. I'll move the water sounds around the periphery. You bring the music sounds into the center and take it back out. So creating a physical dance of uh, sound in the space for everyone to experience. Um, we'd like to play you uh, about 40 seconds of uh, the sound as it was in the gallery. Um, you're going to have to imagine that it's coming from all around you, um, from every direction. Uh, in this case, it's just going to be a singular source coming from your computer. Um. Growth. Mm 
montañas. Cheerful. Okay, so but um, just to just to sort of bring this all to to close, <laughs> so we can move on to our, our next um, presenter co uh, team in the in this panel, um, where we ended up in that moment of watching them play with the sound and co-create almost symphonies, as as Ben is saying, was that we realized that there's a lot of potential for that in how we can create ecological snapshots. Um, of local environments and use this as a form of play and informal science learning within classrooms around the world. So that is that moment where we're actually right now in our project trying to imagine how we can create these uh, this software and the, the methodology and involve more of what we're, we're framing within the landscape of mindful curriculum and have brought on a yet another collaborator to our team is Dr. Karen Ragunadin, who is the director of the Center for Mindful Education at the University of British Columbia. But before we go, we didn't want to leave one thread untied. And do you remember when we were talking about those the sensory values they had when they were talking about water in their everyday life. So they captured it in the sound, but they also captured it in their textual field notes. I cleaned all of their field notes. And again, we got down to around 200, over 200 unique uh, sensory words. And out of that, we gave it to, as part of curating this, let me tell you, Ben and I learned something that if you really wanna be put in your place and know your role as a co-curator, you work with 49 youth. <laughs> And they will be able to tell you all the different dimensions you need. And so we got them to take their the field notes and the, the core concepts and turn it into poetry as part of our gallery guide and our gallery catalog. And so in that we um, we have here an example of how one student then took not only the their own, but all of the words from this list and started to think about their own experience where our project allowed them to think not about um, their senses as Cartesian coordinates, but rather as sensory nodes that we can draw from their individual experiences to create these collaborative sonic ecological snapshots encoded with cultural da uh, data, values, and practices. And we want to end with this short 20 second poetry reading by one of our um, co curators and collaborators. Um, to give you a sense of the continued uh, ripple effects, pun intended, I guess, of um, water in our everyday lives. Water is great, glossy and gurgling. Water is soft, smooth, soothing, and splashy. Water is dew, drip, drowning, and dissolved. It is, it is an alternate universe. Thank you very much. <laughs>